The Tarrant County Master Gardener Association has partnered with the Tarrant Regional Water District to encourage water conservation. TRWD maintains four area lakes and pipelines needed to provide surface water to local water treatment plants so they can clean that water to meet drinking standards for our communities. There are currently 2.3 million people living in Tarrant County and is expected to double over the next 50 years. At SaveTarrantWater.com, you can sign up for free weekly watering advice custom to your location. There's also an event calendar where you can find information about future classes and workshops. So be sure and check out SaveTarrantWater.com to sign up for their free services. Thank you for joining us again. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about trees, shrubs, vines, and then a couple other categories, ornamental grasses and ground covers. I added onto this program uh, because <laughs> the other ones were already so long. So I just thought I would uh, throw those onto this program and, and add a little bit more to this. So, all right. I just want to review uh, about native and adapted plants. Um, you know, native plants are plants that uh, are you know, from Texas um, and are used to our harsh and unpredictable climate. And we have all seen our unpredictable climate this year. Wow. Um, but uh, adapted plants, they're not native to Texas, but they originate from areas that have similar climates and hardiness zones and soil types. So they just work here. Uh, so this program here is not about native plants. It, it, there are some native, but it is about native and adapted plants. So just to make that clear. So why we use native and adapted to review because they are drought, uh, they are tend to be more drought tolerant, heat tolerant, more water efficient and lower use of pesticides and fertilizer. And again, as I said, in one, I think the first program, they just work in our area. Another quick little reminder before we get into the plants, just reminder about the hardiness zone. Uh, Texas covers five zones. I'm not sure there's another uh, state in the United States that can claim that, but when you're choosing plants, make sure they fit into this zone six to nine or six to 10 category, um, you know, depending on exactly where you are in, you know, the state of Texas, but um, choosing plants. So, so if we're in the DFW area, or we're in zone eight. So if you choose plants that are hardy to zone six, you get some um, hardiness on the, the, the freeze hardiness cushion. And then um, if you choose plants that are hardy all the way to zone nine and 10, you get that heat tolerance with those as well. So let's start with trees. We're gonna go over shade trees and ornamental trees. And again, I'm not covering every single tree that works in the state of Texas. I'm just hitting some of the most common ones and ones that I know do well in our area. Starting with Chinese pistache, um, just beautiful fall color. If you, like me, grew up up north and you are craving that beautiful fall color, this is a great tree to give you that. Um, just beautiful reds and oranges. It'll grow about 40 feet tall and wide, has kind of that rounded um, shape to it. Um, they, this uh, Trees are monoecious or dioecious, and like oaks are monoecious. They are... Um, male and female all in one tree, where Chinese pistache is dioecious and it is there's a male tree and a female tree. So if I, I prefer the male tree, um, it's just less messy, um, but there are people who, who like the female tree as well. It, it puts out little colorful berries, but those berries do drop and germinate. Um, so you just have a little bit of weeding to do. But anyway, just little plant knowledge for you there. Uh, Schumard red oak um, does not like wet feet, so make sure it's in a well-drained area. And these get very large. I don't know if you remember in the first program, I showed the plant tag showing that this tree can get up to 80 feet tall. So again, make sure you don't put it under power lines, um, but a very large tree and does great in our area. Uh, as far as um, tree wrap, uh, Chinese pistache and Schumard red oak and maple trees um, have kind of thin bark when they're younger and are susceptible to sun scald. And you will see sun scald on this, usually on the west, southwest side of the uh, bark. And what happens is it basically sunburns that bark and it'll make it split and then more susceptible to borers. So it is recommended that you wrap 
uh, just those three, the, the red oak, pistache, and maple trees. Wrap those with tree wrap, paper tree wrap, and you can pretty much get that in any garden center. Um, just start wrapping at the base and work all the way up to the first um, uh, layer of branches, just for a year or two, just till the, the tree will grow enough of a canopy to shade the trunk. Um, so like when they're at the nursery, they're usually closer together. So each tree is shading the next one. But when you put it out in your landscape and it, it's hit, getting hit with that brutal southwest sun, it can damage the trunk of a young tree. Once it's older, not a big deal. Okay, beautiful red fall color on uh, Schumard red oaks. One thing I do want to note, uh, make sure you are getting a Schumard red oak and not a pin oak. Pin oaks need acidic soil and they do better in East Texas. And if you will look at this tree right here, you can see the tree behind it is really deep green and then this tree is really limey green. It is suffering from chlorosis or iron deficiency because uh, it's in an alkaline area. So it um, cannot, the, the iron in the soil, we do have high iron soil, but it's not available to the plants in an, a high alkaline soil. So um, that's why if you go back to the first program, I stress getting a soil test to make sure you know what, kind, what your pH is, whether you are on the acidic side or the alkaline side. So you can choose the right kind of tree. Anyway, you're gonna see um, in, in chlorotic situations or iron deficient situations, you're gonna see these limey colored leaves, yellowing leaves with dark green veining. And um, it, you know this can be treated but it is treated at the tune of about 20 to $25 per diameter of the tree. So the bigger it gets, the more money it costs. So if you have a young tree that's showing this right now, I would cut your losses and go get a true Schumard red oak. Um, but I'll let you make that decision on whether you wanna spend the money to treat um, because you will have to treat it for the rest of its life. So. Anyway, um, another kind of oak that's great for our area is chinkapin oak. It has a, a very different uh, leaf shape to, you know, your, your uh, typical oak tree, uh, longer and, uh, you know, thinner, and then just has that um, serrated edge. And then fir oak is one of our largest oaks, or they have one of the largest uh, acorns. I mean, they're huge. They are at least golf ball sized. Um, if not a little bigger. Um, so, and, and this, uh, bur oaks can be susceptible to lace bug damage. So you may wanna check into treating with a systemic uh, control for that. What uh, lace bugs do is they suck the, the green out of the chlorophyll, out of the leaves. So they just turn tan and very mottled looking. So you might wanna treat for that. It's not gonna kill the tree, but it does damage the leaves every year. And it just seems that bur oaks are susceptible to that. So check into treating um, for that. Uh, live oaks, um, but this year we saw live oaks suffer terribly in the freeze. Um, we think of live oaks as being evergreen. They actually do lose their leaves every year. They're just losing them at the same time that they're pushing on new growth. And that usually happens somewhere between uh, March and May timeframe. So we don't really notice it as much as our deciduous trees that are dropping in the fall. So, um, but this year they completely defoliated because of the freeze and most of them have put on new growth. I have seen some that are still suffering, but um, most of them have rebounded from that. Um, but anyway, live oaks grow enormous, um, you know, all of, of 60 feet tall, 80 feet wide. They're, they're usually wider than they are tall. And then tend to, their branches tend to grow downward. So not the best tree to put in a parking lot where you, know, you have cars driving under there and you're constantly having to limb them up to, to get their limbs from hanging down into vehicles. Um, but anyway, great trees for our area. <clears throat> Magnolias. Uh, this is a pic the picture on the left is a picture of my DD Blanchard magnolia that is probably I'm looking at it right now it's probably pushing 70 feet tall. Um, it, it, it's a little taller than most because um, it's surrounded by other trees so it's been reaching for light for 25 years or 30 years. Um, anyway, um, 
it this DD Blanchard variety has cinnamon colored uh, backing on the leaves. Um, but just put that if you get that variety, make sure you have a very large area or you know a, a area where it can grow very tall. It may not get 70 feet, but it will get all of 50. So um, it's a very large variety, a grandiflora. Um, so here you can see the large uh, bloom on the on my um, DD Blanchard variety. Um, there are a couple smaller varieties that work well in our area. One of them is called Teddy Bear. It will grow about 20 feet tall, about 10 to 15, well, 10 feet wide or so. Uh, it has quite large, almost rounded leaves on it. And then the other variety is Little Gem, and it too will grow about 20 feet tall and 10 feet wide. It has much more narrow leaves on it, but both of those do uh, very well in our area. Um, they're not particularly drought tolerant. So, you know, I wouldn't put this out in a, um, parking lot surrounded by gravel um, that you don't supplement with water because it probably won't do well for you. Um, I'm not saying that you have to water it any extra than the rest of your landscape, but it will need um, some supplemental water in our area. Okay, maples. Shantung maple is a smaller, it's a Chinese maple and it's a little bit smaller variety. It will only top out at about 30 to 35 feet tall and wide. Um, the regular Shantung is the yellow in fall color, and then the Fire Dragon is red in the fall. And Fire Dragon was patented by Keith Johansson down at Metro Maples. So if you want to get on the Metro Maples uh, website, metromaples.com, you can read all about that. They're great, great small trees. So for instance, you have a one-story house with a small yard. This might be a great tree. Um, Remember I talked about it in the first program as far as scale. Um, if you have a smaller house, you might want a smaller tree. Instead of putting a bur oak in your, your postage stamp front yard, you might consider this tree, just a close up of the yellow fall color on that. All right, ginkgo, speaking of yellow fall color, ginkgo biloba. Um, there's a few varieties of these. Uh, we just got one of these at my church garden called Autumn Gold, and um, it's got the fan shaped leaf to it and beautiful golden fall color. And this tree will drop most of its leaves all in one day. So you don't have a lot of a long drawn out cleanup with ginkgos. Um, but they're a little bit smaller as well, maybe in the 40 foot range. And usually they only sell uh, male varieties. Um, this again is that, you know, um, there's a male tree and a female tree and the female tree has very stinky fruit. So they don't even sell it in our area. They're usually just male varieties. A close-up of those leaves in the fall. All right, cedar elm is um, a great area native for our area and tiny little yellow leaves in the fall, um, just green leaves otherwise. Um, elm trees do tend to put out a lot of seed, so there seems to be a lot of weeding with elm trees, uh, but this is a good uh, a tree for our area. And it will grow probably 60 feet tall, 40 to 60 feet tall and wide. Now, beauty is only skin deep on some trees. So uh, these are beautiful with fall color, but uh, they are not recommended for our area. Now I have an American elm right out. I'm looking at it right now out my office window and it's huge, but it was here. It's just growing along a creek that runs behind my house. And I'm not gonna take it down, but I wouldn't buy one if I had the choice. Bradford pear. You know, 30, 35 years ago, they were all the rage. They're very quick growing trees and they have, you know, um, blooms in the springtime and beautiful fall color, but very narrow branching structure that we have found after about 15 years, if there's a wind storm or a hay or a, um, ice storm, they, that because of that narrow branching structure, it's, it creates a very weak branch structure that will break and half of the tree will just fall off one day. So I bet you almost every one of you have had that happen if you had a Bradford pear or you know someone that that has happened to. So we don't recommend that tree any longer. And then sugar maples are up north. This happens to actually grow in my neighbor's yard, oddly enough. We don't see those widely used down here at all. Eastern red cedar, um, you could probably consider this a very large shrub or tree, but these will grow all of 30 feet tall and wide. Uh, native to our area, evergreen. They create a great screening plant 
Um, here you can see they have screened their neighbor behind them. They work well for that, but just give them plenty of room to grow. All right, Yopon Holly, I think I showed this in one of the other programs, um, just trying to get away from doing the lollipopping or the mushrooming and letting it grow out naturally because they do create a very nice ornamental tree. So we're gonna be moving into the ornamental um, size trees now. So this will grow about 15 feet tall and wide. Evergreen has, um, there's a, again, there's a male variety and there's a female variety. And most people want the female varieties. There's uh, Pride of Houston. There's one, um, something Ann, cannot remember the name. It just went blank on that. But um, great trees for our area. And you can grow them as a large shrub. Genetically, they are shrubs, but we limb them up, remove the bottom limbs to make them be a little ornamental tree. So they do sucker up at the bottom from time to time. So you can just cut those off at the ground and um, maybe you have to do that a couple times a year. Cedar wax wings come in in the winter time, January, February timeframe, and they are so attracted to the berries of Yopon holidays. There's a weeping yopon holly as well in tree form. So it, it has the exact same char characteristics that I described before with the evergreen and the tiny little leaves and profuse red berries in the wintertime, but it just has that weeping draping shape to it. But it will grow, oh, well, 15 feet as well, but all the limbs are hanging down in a draping uh, fashion. And then there's possum ha holly, which is uh, a deciduous, version of the yopon holly. So it loses its leaves in the wintertime, but it retains the berries. And again, the cedar waxwings come in in the wintertime and they will just clean these berries off. It's so fun to watch. This is my neighbor's tree. Um, and it's so pretty in the wintertime when we actually do get some snow because these red berries against, um, you know, at the white background is just so pretty. But uh, also about 15 feet tall and wide. On that, they do tend to sucker quite a bit at the bottom, some of the varieties. So, be, you know, you're going to have to do some maintenance there unless you just leave it as a large shrub. Uh, Vitex, um, again, this will grow 15 feet tall and wide. It can be grown as a shrub or it can be limbed up to form a small ornamental tree. So, um, you know, it will sucker at the bottom and it, it tries to keep being a shrub. So you have to maintain the tree form if you decide to go that route. But it's very easy to do just a couple times a year. You may have to cut the suckers off the bottom. But it, everybody keeps asking, what's that plant with the purple blooms? <laughs> what's that tree with the purple blooms? I get that question all the time this time of year because they're blooming profusely right now. The bees love this plant. Um, you can get it to keep blooming if you deadhead it, but when it's 15 feet tall, you know, you're not going to be climbing up there uh, cutting blooms off, but um, it, it, you know, it will have another flush of blooms, but not as profuse as it does right now this time of year. Okay, Mexican plum. Now, this is a great substitute tree for the Bradford pear that I was talking about before. This is a native and it has beautiful white blooms in the springtime that the bees just love and um, then it has beautiful fall color as well. So um, it's a much, much better tree for our area, but it will grow about that, well, maybe not quite as big as a, a tall as a Bradford pear, but um, it'll be somewhere in the 30, 20 to 30 foot range. Great tree for our area. And then red buds, lots of different red buds. They will grow about 20 feet tall and wide. They have a very wide uh, growth pattern to them. The canopy is very wide with heart-shaped leaves. There's a variety called burgundy hearts. There's another one called forest pansy that have um, these heart-shaped burgundy leaves. There's a variety called rising sun. There's another one called um, hearts of gold that have these lime green heart-shaped leaves to them. So these are great small trees for our area. Um, they need good drainage though. Saucer magnolia, I talked about the magnolias early on that are evergreen. Well, this is a deciduous magnolia. So they drop their leaves and they put these blooms on before their leaves and then the leaves come after that. So uh, just again, another nice small ornamental tree for our area. It'll grow about, oh, 15-ish, maybe, maybe up to 20 feet tall and 10 feet wide or so. Chautauqua, 
You know what? I just realized I don't have a picture of a desert willow in this program, but this is a cross between a catalpa tree and a desert willow. So um, desert willow is shalopsis, so it's a chatalpa. Um, and they, they have um, desert willow looking leaves, but they have catalpa looking blooms. Um, I grew up in Wisconsin and we used to grow catalpa trees up there and they have this, this type of a bloom on it, but they have a very large leaf and um, th they don't do well down here. But this is a great little ornamental tree to try and very drought tolerant. Uh, when I planted this over at my church garden, I think I stuck a little scrap in the ground and I had a maybe a bottle of water in my truck that I poured on it and <laughs> never did another thing and that thing rooted in and it's still doing great today. So it'll be about 30 five, 30 feet tall or so wide, very um, kind of a mounded shape to it. Full sun for all of those trees that I mentioned. Uh, Japanese maples. Now these are trees for shade. Uh, definitely not native to our area, um, but they will handle our understory conditions very well. Um, in Oregon, they can grow these in full sun, but not in Texas. Actually, you can see my, grand, my Dee Dee Blanchard magnolia in the background there. So there's lots of different uh, Japanese maples. Again, if you go to the Metro Maples site and read about all the different varieties that he carries, uh, I think he probably carries about 60 different varieties. There's upright green, upright burgundy. There's weeping green, weeping burgundy, lots of different varieties. There's dwarf varieties. I bought one this year that tops out at two feet tall and four feet wide. So just a lot of fun. I have, I think 29 maples in my yard. So check those out. Uh, crepe myrtles. Um, again, they're not native. They're native to China, but they do work well in our area. And I know up in McKinney, they have the McKinney uh, crepe myrtle trails of McKinney, where their goal is to have every crepe myrtle known to man growing in that city. So you can drive up there and see all the different varieties, lots of um, different colors on that. One thing though, um, the mantra is stopping the chop and crepe murder, we call it. Um, I heard somebody say the other day, they don't want to call it crepe murder, they want to call it crepe mutilation. So because it doesn't kill the tree, it doesn't really murder it, uh, but it does disfigure it. So uh, we are trying to get away from that practice. And the way to do that is to choose the variety that fits the space. Remember, right plant, right place. So if you don't want a 30 foot variety, you know, at the corner of your house, then choose a variety that's going to grow maybe eight to 12 feet because they're out there. There are crepe myrtles that grow three feet tall um, as little shrubs. And there are crepe myrtles that grow 30 feet tall and everything in between. So choose the color that you want and the height, mature height that you want. If you have murdered your crepe myrtle in the past, or if it's had freeze damage, there is a fix to that. You can actually take the crepe myrtle and cut the whole thing down, take a chainsaw and cut the whole thing down at the ground. You can see the old stump right here. And then what happens is it will send up, oh, at least 20 new stems. And what you do then is you will pick half of those, maybe 10 of those that are the strongest and cut the rest of them back down to the ground and just leave those strongest stems to grow for a while a year and then the next year you'll come back in and reduce that down again and pick somewhere between three five maybe up to seven of the strongest stems to become your new tree again and it only takes a couple years to uh, form a nice new tree again and then you can just let it grow to its potential and don't murder or mutilate it anymore one thing that um, i'm getting lots of questions on now people are seeing crepe myrtle bark scale so this is an insect, it's not a disease, it's actually an insect. If you were to take your hand and squish one of those white insects, it will be pink inside. You'll see this pink residue just squish out. Um, so you know that it's alive and active. Um, so the recommended treatment from Texas A&M is imidacloprid. This is one brand of imidacloprid. It is a systemic, um, it comes in a granular form and it also comes in a liquid form. Now, um, this will kill bees. If you were to spray it directly on the bees, you will kill it. Um, so will neem oil, which is an organic. If you spray it directly on a bee, you're gonna kill it. 
So um, just read the label, follow the directions and use it accordingly. Um, the recommended time is late May, early June to apply it. And again, it's systemic. It takes it up through the roots and takes it all the way up to the top to kill this scale. If you see this on your crepe myrtle, do not treat with imidacloprid because you will kill this little critter too. This is a twice stabbed lady beetle, which is the ladybug that will take care of this scale for you. So on the, the middle picture there, those are the old pupil cases that, um, you know, when they um, uh, molt, they come out of those cases. And then this is the adult on the lower right-hand side right there. So if you see those on your tree, don't treat because she'll do the job for you. And I love it when nature will take care of these problems like that. Um, there, you can also, if you have a small crepe myrtle and you have a, just a slight infestation, you can even take like a toothbrush or a, a brush and kind of scrub the scale. And then you can spray it with horticultural oil or you can just spray it with horticultural oil and it will smother these scale insects. But if you have a severe infestation like that picture I just showed you there, probably need to call out the big guns and treat that. It, it won't kill your crate myrtle, but it will not look good. And what happens is the scale secretes sooty uh, uh, honeydew, which is its excrement, and then that is sticky, and then mold grows in that. So you end up having all this black mold uh, growing on the bark as well. And the beautiful thing about crate myrtles is that they do shed their bark. So um, once you get rid of the scale, uh, insect, then the next year the plant will shed its bark. In fact, they're shedding right now. So you get all new clean bark underneath, but you got to get rid of that insect. All right, uh, then let's move into the shrub category. Again, I'm sure I've not touched on every tree out there or uh, large or ornamental, but I'm um, just hitting some highlights. Large shrub. This is Nellie R. Stevens Holly, one of our absolute best large screening shrub. Um, if you look at the picture on the left, the, that light pole there is probably 30 feet tall, and you can tell that that shrub is over halfway as tall as that light pole. And, and the, the parking space right there is nine feet wide, so you can see that it's grown at least 10, 11, maybe 12 feet wide, and th those have never, ever been pruned. On the right-hand side, that has been pruned, as you can see, very tightly, but it's still been allowed to grow very large. Um, so put this plant where it can grow to its potential. Another way to grow it is to um, limb it up or tree it up, removing the bottom branches and then just letting the top grow out naturally. So um, I've seen those called uh, patio trees or heard them called patio trees. So um, that's just another idea. I've seen savanna hollies grown that way as well. And uh, Eagleston holly, uh, a lot of times are used as patio trees where they've removed the bottom limbs and then just allowed the top to grow out. So those are also great varieties for our area. Nellie R is hard to beat though. Uh, Oakland holly is a holly that just uh, naturally grows in this pyramidal form like that. Um, they say if you want a pyramidal shaped holly that you, uh, almost never have to prune, try Oakland because it grows so slowly. Uh, there's oak leaf and Oakland holly. Um, you can't really tell the difference between them. Oakland holly was a sport off of oak leaf. So they look almost exactly the same and grow almost the same. Yopon holly, I showed you the Yopon holly ornamental tree. This is the Yopon holly shrub. So these are just little low growing, um, maybe a good boxwood substitute. These are native to our area, so they do very, very well for us. I like to prune them in a dome shape instead of, um, I guess, what everybody calls a meatball. So I will use a hedge trimmer on this every February and just cut it into that dome shape. And if you will do this every February to keep it size controlled, it, you can keep it. I've had mine for 20 years and um, I keep them at about two and a half feet tall and three feet wide. So it's very easy to do that if you just cut them really hard every February. Uh, Burford holly is an excellent, excellent shrub for our area. Um, one thing I want, do want to point out is don't plant hollies that have prickly leaves next to the air conditioner because um, you want to have a little pity on them <laughs> because they have to get in and work around them. And you do too if you have to clean out the oil or whatever it's called. Um, 
But anyway, this plant will is very easy to keep at about three feet tall and wide with a hard prune every spring. Um, it's even easier to keep at four to five feet tall and wide. Just an excellent, excellent shrub for our area and just breezed through that freeze that we had. Uh, Carissa holly is another um, great holly for our area. It, it will grow about four feet tall and wide and just naturally has a domed uh, shape to it. And then needlepoint holly, I think if you were to put Burford holly and needlepoint holly right next to each other, most people cannot tell the difference between the two. Burford holly has a little bit more of a puckered look to it, uh, its leaf, and needlepoint has a little bit smoother look to it, but needlepoint will grow six to eight feet tall and wide. So if you need a little bit larger uh, evergreen holly, needlepoint is an excellent, excellent um, screening shrub, but doesn't get quite as big as Nellie R. So if you need kind of something in that in-between, needlepoint is excellent. I use that all the time for screening. In fact, I've planted, just planted three in my yard this year. Okay, Nandinas. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody has their opinions about Nandinas, but if you will grow the dwarf non-burying burying Nandinas, they don't spread. They are very well behaved. They have beautiful color. They work in full sun or part shade. I mean, they're just so versatile. And if you will prune them every February, um, I'm gonna explain how to do that. You can keep them very small. I've had mine for 20 years. I'll show you in a second. But this is Gulf Stream. There's a variety called Obsession that grows exactly the same. It just has a little bit a more burgundy coloration to it. There is Lemon Lime that has the same shape as the Gulf Stream. It just has more uh, limey colored leaves to it. Uh, this is Nana or Firepower. Firepower is supposed to be an improvement over Nana, but um, they stay very small, very easy to prune, beautiful red color in the wintertime. And then none of these produce berries or spread. Now, one thing I do want to say is please, please, please let's help the poor Nandinas. Um, never ever take a hedge trimmer to a Nandina. They are always pruned by hand. Uh, if you want to see these shrubs, you can drive down 377 in Keller. And there they are. And that's how they look every year. Uh, but these are my Nandinas and they get pruned every February. You take the tallest canes or stems and you follow those down to the ground and you take your little hand pruners and prune them at the ground or as close to the ground as you can get. And that gr the new growth then comes at the point of where they were cut. So then they stay very full and compact. And um, they, again, mine are 20 years old and they look just like that. So again, don't spread, don't produce berries. Excellent, excellent shrubs for our area. All right, the next category abelias. And I always joke with people, after this freeze, I'm down to three categories of shrubs, hollies, nandinas, and abelias, because there's lots of hollies, there's lots of nandinas, and there's lots of abelias. So you can choose all kinds of plants just from those three categories, but I'll show you a few more. But anyway, abelia, there's so many different varieties of abelias. There are abelias that will grow six to eight feet tall and wide, uh, like um, a glossy abelia. And now there are lots of newer varieties that stay smaller. Kaleidoscope, Rose Creek, um, there's Twist of Lime, Radiance, Twist of Orange, um, Canyon Creek. Um, Edward Goucher will grow about five feet tall and wide and it's got a little bit more pink blooms to it. So this is Rose Creek uh, at my house. And so I prune this hard. I actually take a hedge trimmer to it. Uh, in February and cut it in kind of a dome shape. And then I don't touch it again the rest of the year. And this is how they look in August. So um, they do get morning sun and afternoon shade, uh, but they can handle all day sun as well. And they, they have the most fragrant white blooms on them. This is right at my driveway. So when I come in and get out of my truck, I can just smell that fragrance right there. They're just so lovely. It's almost gardenia-ish, the fragrance. Okay, so um, just Canyon Creek is another one of my favorites. It does grow a little bit taller, probably five, five feet and all of four feet, maybe five feet tall and five to six feet wide. So it's very, I, I, it's almost upright, like a spray look to it almost. And then kaleidoscope abelia, just again, showing that in a, in a landscape setting. 
So they're just a nice bright limey colored shrub that has a mounded shape to it um, that fits, um, you know, when you need a small shrub that goes underneath our windows that are a foot and a half off the ground, Kaleidoscope is a great choice. Uh, one of those small Nandinas would be a great choice and um, Yopon Holly would be a great choice if you've got a full sun area. All right, uh, Ligustrum. This is Sunshine Ligustrum. Now, I don't recommend the wax leaf Ligustrum because pretty much everybody, if you didn't lose it completely, it was damaged very badly in the freeze. And they can suffer, the, the wax leaf can suffer freeze damage even in a much less cold event than we had, but it pretty much wiped them out this time. I think there are some I've seen coming back, but it's gonna take a while for them to get big again. But I'll let you decide whether you wanna keep them and wait that timing. But Sunshine, it's newer on the market. It's been out, oh, I don't know, at least five years, maybe a little bit longer than that. I lose track of time, but it's got this bright, bright, you know, in your face, yellow color to it. Now it does need full sun to keep that color. If you put this in a shady area, it's just going to be regular green. And you know, that's kind of boring. I mean, you plant this plant because you want that vibrant color. I mean, look at it with the, the cone flower and the Laatris and the daylilies there next to that dark green holly. That is such a pretty setting right there. Um, so, but these will grow, oh, five feet tall and wide. So um, if you want them just to have a natural shape and you don't want to be pruning on them a lot, just let them grow to their natural shape. And they're a little bit tall. Maybe they're about four feet wide, five feet tall, four feet wide, because they grow a little bit taller than they do wide. But um, they are very easy to prune. Just take a hand pruner to them in February if you need to size control them and just cut the, the limbs down um, and just let it grow back in a natural shape. I have also seen where uh, people will prune this really hard and uh, almost topiary it. So um, you can do that too. It's just higher maintenance. I tend to go more with that Canyon Creek abelia because uh, you get that limey color, maybe not quite this intense, but you also get blooms out of it where this ligustrum does not bloom. So there is that to it, but it, it certainly has a lot of color. So give that a try. Uh, spireas, um, the bridal wreath, it's quite large. It will grow, oh, six feet tall and wide. So put it where you don't have to prune it. It blooms very early in the July time frame, mid July. I'm July. I'm sorry. In the March time frame, mid March. Um, I got July on the brain. Anyway, so it blooms very early in the spring before your trees have leaves on. So you can actually put this under a deciduous tree and it should still bloom fairly well for you because the trees don't put their leaves on until April. So it, it's getting the winter sun that it needs to produce those blooms. There's a double bloomer. There's, um, you know, the, just a regular single bloom, but it has that drapey form to it. So you don't wanna be pruning that into a tight shape. Just let it grow to its potential. And then there's some smaller varieties like Anthony Water that and Gold Mound or Lime Mound and they will bloom in the May timeframe, but they stay much smaller. My trick on Anthony Water variety is just cut it to the ground in February. Literally take a hedge trimmer and whack it to the ground. I usually don't do that to lime mound or gold mound because they stay so much smaller. I mean, they top out at two and a half feet, maybe just a little, little mound. So you can pretty much, if you want to trim those, just give them a haircut. But the Anthony water, chop it to the ground. Um, and that keeps it from getting woody and rangy. It just puts on all new growth and, and just keeps a nice um, growth habit too then. And then we'll bloom in May. Don't prune the bridal wreath early because you'll cut off all the blooms. Prune bridal wreath if you have to after it blooms. All right, Rose of Sharon or Althea. Now this is a plant that uh, you, you're, you're seeing it blooming now as well, um, summer bloomer, and you can grow it as a little patio, single trunked standard, they call them, a tree form. You can grow it as a multi-trunk, or you can grow it as a large shrub. This is at my church garden. Uh, this is the variety Aphrodite, but lots and lots of varieties of this. There's double bloomers like the lavender chiffon up on the left hand right there. And then there's single bloomers. Some of them have um, just a solid color. Some of them have a darker center to them, but just tons of varieties. There's a new um, variety 
uh, or series called smoothie. So there's strawberry smoothie, raspberry smoothie, blueberry smoothie, peppermint smoothie, all of those varieties that have a double bloom. There's one called purple pillar that grows very tall and narrow, like two to three feet wide and up to eight to 12 feet tall. So if you've got something that you need in a narrow, sunny area, that would be a variety to check out. They uh, do not like uh, wet, wet feet though. Make sure they have well draining soil or they can succumb to rotting. Ceniso, speaking of plants that need super, super good drainage, this is a Texas sage that, uh, they also call this the barometer bush because it blooms usually after uh, a rain um, with these, purple blooms and it's um it's got grayish kind of foliage there's one variety called green cloud that has a little bit more green uh foliage to it but after, when it's done blooming it's just a large gray shrub so put this where it can grow large and try not to you know shear this into shapes it just looks um better when it's allowed to just grow if you do need to size control it i would just do it by hand hand pruning in february and you can cut it um, down and then keep it will keep it bushier my experience with this plant is if it's getting a lot of water like with the rest of your landscape and it's getting too much shade it ends up looking really crummy just kind of weak and rangy and thin so the prettiest one i've ever ones i've ever seen were on in the median on 157 down toward Bedford and they were surrounded by concrete and gravel and they were gorgeous. Um, I don't know what the watering system was or if they were getting any water at all, but this is a great, great drought tolerant, heat tolerant, full sun shrub for our area. Flowering quince, this is a, another early blooming um, shrub that puts on blooms before foliage. One thing I do want to note, the old varieties do have big old thorns, so if I can show you that right there. <laughs> so be careful around that shrub, but uh, it's just a fun, you know, shrub to have those early, early spring blooms like February, March time frame. That's how early they bloom along with the daffodils. Um, and then after that, when they put their leaves on, they're just a green shrubs. Some of the varieties can go grow quite large. So read about the different varieties. There are some newer dwarf, more dwarf ones. Uh, Forsythia, again, another early, early blooming uh, shrub for our area with those bright yellow blooms in that February, early March timeframe. And then again, puts on the leaves after that. And then it's just a green shrub the rest of the season. It's going to need full sun to give you the best bloom. But if you have it around deciduous trees, it should do okay in there because it's going to get that, again, that early winter sun that it needs to form bloom. Mock orange, this is a plant that's going to need a part shade situation. Um, I don't know if any of you grow this, let me know maybe in the comments and, and the conditions that you grow it in. I, I don't grow it. I used to years ago, but I had an old timey, really heavily spreading variety and I ended up taking it out. But this, I think that some of these newer varieties don't spread. Uh, this was taken at the Grapevine Botanic Garden. So if you want to see what it looks like now, um, it does, this was taken, I think in April, So it was blooming then. And some of the varieties have very fragrant, um, they call it mock orange because it smells like an orange uh, bloom. But um, I, some people have told me that their varieties don't have a fragrance. So um, you just have to read about this plant, but it's going to grow about, oh, four, six feet tall and wide-ish. Mahonia, leather leaf mahonia, uh, I have found is the most cold hardy for our area. It's very prickly though. So, you know, put this in, the, it's, it's for the shade garden. Uh, put this where you're not gonna be walking by it and bumping into it because it's extremely prickly, but it is a great, great plant for um, a full shade area in the winter. It'll get these yellow blooms and then it's followed by these purplish blue berries and it will grow about four feet tall, maybe up to six feet tall. It can, it can be a little gangly looking, so you might want to plant in mass so you have a big um, collection of those. There is a newer variety called Soft Caress. There's a couple other ones out that I cannot remember the name, maybe Marvel or something like that, Mahonia. Um, I have found though that Soft Caress is not cold hardy. And this year completely wiped it out, but I have had it freeze to the ground in way less cold weather than we had this year. So I I cannot recommend it unless you are willing to protect it, but it is not prickly at all. That's what I had high hopes for that plant because it grows about three to four feet tall. It's evergreen. 
are supposed to be evergreen and then it gets the same uh, yellow um, blooms on it in the winter time. And I just was so excited about this plant, but where I want a three to four foot evergreen shrub, I don't want to start at the ground every year like a perennial. So I was very disappointed, but it's completely out of my garden now because they all died. I had one left that didn't die from other freezes and this year took that one out. So make sure you put it in a protected spot or be willing to protect it with frost cloth or um, you know, some sort of protectant if we get a extreme cold winter again. Or maybe you live a little bit farther south in the Metroplex where it's a little more protected. Another great shrub for full shade is Akuba, gold dust Akuba. What I like about it are these speckly leaves that um, just are so bright in a dense shady area. It cannot handle sun. It can handle some morning sun, but you wanna be careful in afternoon sun. If the leaves turn black, it's either getting too much sun or it's in a poorly draining area. So this plant again needs well draining soil or it can succumb to uh, rot as well. So um, again, if you're seeing black leaves, check to see if it's in too much sun. And if that's not the case, check your drainage and improve that. Because I've had this plant in my yard for 20 years and it's done very well for me. In 2011, that horrible, horrible hot year that we had, um, we, I did have some of the leaves turn black because it was so hot for such a sustained time, but those black leaves fell off and it put on all new growth again and it's been fine. And it will grow about four to six feet tall and wide um, with a lot of time. They're not very quick growing, but you pretty much never have to do anything to this plant. If you've got it in the right conditions, you just do nothing to it. There is a solid green variety. There's a dwarf variety that grows about, oh, three feet tall and wide. It'll get these red berries on it. Uh, but just plain green. But again, for full shade. Um, I think I may have mentioned this one in the in the uh, perennial program, so I guess it could go in either category. But this is uh, also a little bit cold tender, so be careful that you put that in a protected spot or be willing to protect it. But Fatsia or Japanese Aurelia has very large palmate-shaped leaves, and it gets these really cool blooms on it in the winter time, like January time frame, maybe even into in December. But it will grow if it's really happy and protected. It can grow oh six feet tall and wide. Uh, mine usually only gets about four feet tall and wide, and then I'll lose part of it in a freeze. So again, be careful and protect that. But it's cool for the shade garden if you've got a protected spot. Um, here's a great um, low-growing evergreen yew, plum yew or Japanese spreading yew, and it's it's called spreading yew because of its form. It's it grows wider than it does tall. It doesn't spread as in as in invasively. It's not invasive at all. It's extremely slow growing, as a matter of fact. So it's called prostrata. Uh, this is a, just an up close of the foliage. Um, but if you need a low growing, low and wide growing evergreen for the shade, this is an excellent plant, just excellent. It doesn't bloom or anything, but um, if you just need something evergreen to grace the ground, that's a great, great plant. I planted mine in 2011 and it sailed through that summer and it sailed through this winter. So it's pretty tough. Hydrangeas, lots of different types of hydrangeas. The ones that do the best here are the oak leaf hydrangeas. Now they do grow very large. This is a variety called Alice in this picture and um, it will get at least eight feet tall and wide. So put it where you can let it grow. If you do have to trim it to size control it, do that immediately after it's done blooming. In fact, right now would be the time to do any pruning on oak leaves if you have to. That way they have time to regrow and uh, set their blooms next spring. The mop heads or the macrophylla or the large leaf hydrangeas like Endless Summer and, and Lady in Red and those types of varieties, um, they are they tend to like a lot of water. Oak leaf is not as thirsty as the, the macrophylla varieties. Be willing to supplement those if you, if you wanna use hydrangeas. Uh, if you have alkaline soil, you're going to have pink blooms. If you have acidic soil, you're going to have blue. And if you want to force them to be blue, you have to add acidic soil amendments to your soil. Do that. Um, there's a 
there's a soil acidifier that Espoma makes that you can use that. Then there are other varieties. I don't have these pictured. I don't see a lot of those, but I'm, I'm seeing a few of them now in um, around our area. The paniculata, paniculata varieties like uh, limelight, that's one variety. So do your research on those. Um, make sure you're, you're giving them supplemental water and they actually, that variety can actually take sun. I do tend to see those more in cooler climates like up north. I'm seeing some people having success with them down here as long as you supplement with water. But oak leaf is probably the best for our area. Um, I think I may have mentioned this one again in the perennial program, but this is American Beauty Berry. There is a white varying variety as well. And you can let it grow large, like eight feet tall and wide if you never, ever, ever prune it. Um, I like to keep mine about four feet tall. So I cut mine back down to about two feet tall in the uh, late winter um, and then let it bush back out again to keep it size controlled. And the birds love these berries. I'm not going to show a lot of roses. Everybody's familiar with roses. What I do want to talk about though is be sure to be on the lookout for rose rosette disease. It's I'm still seeing it our, in our area and it's a virus. There is no cure for it. So you do need to remove the rose completely and discard it. Uh, these are some symptoms of excessive thorns, uh, red pigmentation. And it's not just if it's red uh, new growth because there's a lot of roses that have red new growth, but it will be very distorted, gnarly looking new growth. So that's a classic symptom. And then the leaves are just very distorted and stacked on top of each other because what happens in rose rosette is the it's a virus that causes the internodes which is the space between each node to shorten so it's like the leaves are all just smashed on top of each other um, so anyway it's very obvious if you have it please destroy that rose bag it up and throw it away it, it doesn't spread to other kinds of plants but only roses so and it's carried spread by a microscopic mite um, that that infects the rose. I do want to talk about some shrubs that have been used in our area, but I'm now after the freeze and from some other issues, I'm personally not recommending them anymore. But um, if you want to use them, just I just want to give you some information so that you can make uh, better choices. So this is Laura Petalum. Everybody's like, what's that big purple bush? So burgundy bush. So that's Laura Petalum. There are varieties that grow very, very large, like nine feet tall and wide. Uh, there are some shorter varieties, um, but they will be four to six feet tall and wide. So read the label, put them in the right spot. One thing that I'm seeing is stem canker or bacterial gall. Uh, anything that wounds the stem can bring it on like pruning or hail or a critter chewing on it. So um, you're going to see this black stuff that looks like the stem kind of explodes from the middle. Uh, there's no cure for it. Um, you can cut that limb off if you can, but if it if it gets down to the base of the shrub, you, it, it, you get a lot of dieback from it because it destroys that stem. And so anything beyond that, that uh, canker area then dies. So if your lower petalum is looking bad, start looking at the stems. And if you're buying a new one, be sure to look for this, that you're not getting one that's already infected. Because if you do have it already and you prune, every pruning cut, you have to disinfect your pruners or it's going to, you're going to spread it all over that shrub. Uh, the other problem I see with Laura Petalum is uh, iron deficiency. Again, you see those yellowing leaves with the dark green veins. It tends to like a little bit more on the acid side of pH. So if you have more acidic soil and great drainage, give this, you can still try this plant, but if you've got alkaline soil and poor drainage, that's what it's going to look like. And then finally, you know, I call it the trifecta of done. <laughs> it's like the third, you know, thing that just makes me not want to use this plant anymore. Is this is after the freeze. Now you can notice at the base of that shrub that it is trying to come back. So if you do want to, you know, if you have that this have this happen in your landscape and you want to give it a chance to come back again, by all means, cut all that top frozen area off and you may have already um, and let it come back out from the base. Um, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, but I just, after it, we've had such major freeze damage with it and it already had a couple other problems. I'm just not willing to put any time into this particular plant anymore. Personal opinion. Uh, the next one in that same category is Indian hawthorn. Uh, we've been struggling with that entomosporium fungal leaf spot for years, and you can treat it with a fungicide, but I don't want plants that I'm having to constantly treat. So 
um, it's, it's, you know, it's just a, a problem with this plant. Photinias have the same problem. And, and then um, what's the, there's a worm, um, bag worms. Those are the worms that come in and chew on the leaves and then form little bags around themselves. Uh, you can treat bag worms with um, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, if you spray that in the late May, early June timeframe when they're when the little worms are coming out of the bags. But once they're in the bags and mama lays all those eggs in there, they you can't get that spray into them and they're going so treat them when they're teeny tiny little worms emerging from the bags. Then they all froze. This is at my church garden and we probably removed 200 of them. So uh, if you want, again, some of them are coming back from the base. If you want to cut these off at the ground and let them come back from the ground, um, you know, you can do that as well. But uh, they do are very susceptible to fungal leaf spots. So um, if you're willing to treat them, you know, it's, it's okay, shrub. And they do bloom in the springtime. So if you're going to grow this, be sure that you don't uh, prune it in the springtime or you will cut off all the blooms. Make sure you wait till after they're done blooming and let them just grow into that. Um, mounded shape. All right, Podocarpus, uh, a lot of people call this U as well, Y-E-W. Um, this is actually at my neighbors across the street, and they have the only one that I have seen that survived the freeze looking like that. She sent me that picture today. I mean, it looks that good. Everybody else's that I know looks like that from the freeze. Um, they, they just really, really took a hit. So um, if you're going to grow this plant, make sure you have it in a protected and very well draining spot. It does not like soggy soil. Um, some of them I've seen do have new growth, like right here, you can see new growth coming back on them. So if you want to take the time to tediously prune out all the brown, you know, it may come back fine for you. I'll let you make that decision, but just know that this, this, this plant is susceptible to freeze in less freeze uh, events than we had this February, but this year really took out a lot of them. Um, and I've seen this plant grow 20 feet tall, and, um, but you also can prune it very hard if you need to. Um, pittosporum, um, this is a variegated pittosporum that grows very, very, very large. And this is what they all look like this year. So if you're gonna grow pittosporum, make sure you, you put it in a protected spot or just be willing to lose it when we have a hard, hard, hard freeze. Um, I, again, I've seen pittosporum suffer in much less freeze events than we had in February, um, but nothing like I've seen this February. I mean, it took them all out. So um, yeah, Wheeler's Dwarf is a, a smaller variety. Again, it's susceptible to freezing too, but if you have it in a protected spot or you're a little farther south in the Metroplex, it's a fine shrub. It's just not as cold hardy as I would like it to be. All right, ornamental grasses, and we're just about done here. So uh, I love ornamental grasses. Um, this is my favorite, Adagio. It plumes or has that inflorescence earlier than all of them. It will, it will, it will have those in the summertime where most ornamental grasses, it takes till the fall for them to put off their show. Uh, put on their show. And I love in the wintertime after we get a freeze because you get the colorful um, blades of grass then as well. It's just ribbons of color on that um, grass in the, in the wintertime. And I leave it through the wintertime because I like that look in the winter just to add texture. And then I cut it back hard in February to the ground or down to maybe three inches. Uh, pink muley is a, a, another um, type of ornamental grass. It'll grow about three feet tall and wide, maybe a little bit less than that, and it gets these pink plumes on it, but not till like November time frame. So this one does bloom very, very late in the year, but it's a showstopper when it blooms or when you see it planted in mass. Uh, pine muley is one of my favorite grasses as well. Um, it, it doesn't, it, what I like about it is it holds this form, this kind of erect form like that. It doesn't get floppy. Um, it, it doesn't have a colorful inflorescence to it, but I, it's just, they're just tan little seed heads, but it's kind of got a gray green um, foliage to it. And I just really, really like that strong form that it adds in the garden. And it will grow about two and a half feet tall and all of three feet wide. So it's, it's really a great, great uh, ornamental grass. The last kind of muley, this is a native, this is Lindheimer's muley and it will grow 
oh, four to five feet tall and wide and maybe push even a little taller than that when it gets its, its inflorescence on it in the uh, fall. So it's just a really, really great grass for our area. Extremely, extremely drought tolerant. So you can rot this grass if you give it too much water. So this is a great plant for out in those medians with um, you know, gravel around them. Um, then one of our smallest grasses is Mexican feather grass. Um, again, extremely drought tolerant. Just turn the water off to these um, because they will rot if they get too much water. Um, they are very kind of floppy though, or flowy in the breeze. You can see, I took a picture there where the wind was blowing and they're all, they just really go with the breeze. So um, kind of fun to watch, kind of flowy when the, wind, the breeze is blowing, but they'll only grow about a foot and a half tall and wide, maybe two feet tall. So they, they'll fit in those smaller spaces. Vines. Um, one of my favorite is cross vine. Uh, this is not trumpet vine. I do not recommend trumpet vine. It's extremely invasive, but this will kind of give you that same look with a much, much more well-behaved vine. It's evergreen, um, but it's a, it's a strong grower and it will grow all of 20 feet. So make sure you have a nice big trellis to put it on or you're gonna have to prune it a little bit. But, um, it will bloom in the May, June timeframe with these, uh, this is called tangerine beauty. So with these tangerine colored blooms, it's another variety I think that has more yellow blooms on it. Um, I've never grown that one, but I'm sure it grows in the same way. Just a great vine for our area. Another one is Carolina jessamine. A lot of people wanna call it jasmine, but it's jessamine. And um, it will bloom in March with these beautiful fragrant yellow blooms on it. And it too is evergreen um, and they're both hardy for our area. Now this is Confederate Jasmine and this variety Madison is the most cold hardy of the Confederate Jasmines. And there's another one I think starts with an M. It's got more of a yellow bloom on it. I uh, can't remember the name of that one either. Boy, I'm having trouble tonight, sorry. Uh, it's another, uh, it's not Madison, Madison is the white and there's another one that begins with an M that's more yellow, uh, but they are both the most cold hardy of the Confederate Jasmine, but I still had mine freeze to the ground this year and this is mine. Um, uh, I have the Madison variety, but it froze to the ground and it came back from the root. I've had that happen one other time and I've, I've grown this vine for probably 15 years. So be willing to lose it to the ground and have to start over or be willing to lose it completely if you don't have it in a protected spot. I have mine on the south side of my house against my uh, fireplace um, chimney. So it is a very protected spot and I still had it freeze, but it's coming back. Um, I may not see any blooms out of it this year, but it is coming back. So it's so fragrant though. Oh my goodness, it is so fragrant. Put this vine where you can appreciate the, the fragrance of those blooms. It's just intoxicating. And it'll grow, it's very strong grower too. Uh, I would put it on a trellis that's, you know, at least eight feet tall or so. It'll probably grow more than that, but I just keep mine trimmed at about that height. Uh, this is a uh, clematis. Now these are gorgeous when they're in bloom and they look a little crummy this time of year when the heat gets to them, but in the springtime, they are awesome. Um, and there, if you have a smaller trellis or a smaller space that you want to put a vine, um, this, uh, try a clematis. There's a, a variety called clematis pitcheri that's got this little bell-shaped bloom to it. And then there's evergreen clematis or clematis armandii that uh, has these long, deep green um, leaves to it, evergreen, and it will get these fragrant white blooms on it as well. And there's another clematis that I forgot to note it on, on here is um, sweet autumn clematis. It gets cut to the ground every year uh, and then it grows very aggressively and blooms white blooms that look a lot like this in the fall. And it too is very fragrant, but um, you need to cut that to the ground every year, the, the um, sweet autumn clematis. This Armandii is evergreen. So uh, in moving into ground covers now real quickly, uh, that tall ground cover at the background there, that is that prostrate U that I was talking about before, that Cephalotaxis herringtonia prostrata. So they clumped it in a, a big area right there because it very, grows very low and wide. So they used that as a ground cover and planted it in mass. And then they came down to the next layer and planted Asian jasmine. And this is about the only way I like Asian jasmine is when it's by itself nothing else growing in it. If you have a tree growing in it, I'm okay with that, but I do not like Asian jasmine. 
growing in a bed with shrubs. It just creates a maintenance hassle. And the Asian jasmine wants to grow all over your shrubs. This is purple winter creeper because it turns purple in the winter and it grows a lot like Asian jasmine. It's just a vining ground cover. So just, you'll get some purple color out of it. It is a euonymus though. So it is susceptible to scale insects. So you may have to treat for that, but it, it's a great ground cover for our area. All euonymus are scale magnets. So I don't recommend talking about shrubs again. I do not recommend golden euonymus. Absolute scale magnet. Just stay away from that plant. I should put a picture in here, um, but just you, know, you can Google it and see what I'm talking about. Old timey shrub. Anyway, this is purple winter creeper on the vine category. So or ground cover category. Sorry. Um, Asian jasmine, purple winter creeper for maintenance. If you'll just weed eat it down to three to four inches in February, just buzz it down with your weed eater, then it'll put on all new fresh growth for um, the season. This is big blue liriope. This is the kind of ground cover I prefer to use under trees because you can buzz this down in February and um, then let it grow back, but you can blow it out, you can rake it out, um, you can keep it cleaner through the season than Asian jasmine, and you only have to prune it once and you're done, whereas the vining ground covers are, to me, a little bit more maintenance because you have to keep them from climbing up the, the, over the sidewalk, you have to keep them from climbing up the trunk of the tree, whereas a liriope, and this is a spreading variety called big blue, there's another kind of variety called super blue, but it's a clump, a larger clump form. So anyway, this is a great variety. There's also another one called Silver Dragon. That's a spreading ground cover type, and it's got very highly uh, variegated leaves, uh, almost a silvery look to it called Silver Dragon. With Liriope, as I just mentioned, if you just buzz it down to approxim approximately two inches in February, just take your weed eater and buzz it down, and it'll come back, and you won't have to do anything else to it. But you only want to do that once a year, because it just puts on that new growth once a year, and you don't want to cut that off. If you have a shady sloping area, a great ground cover is Mondo grass. This is regular Mondo. So it'll grow about eight inches tall and it quickly spreads, but it needs shade, whereas the, the liriope can handle some sun. So Mondo grass. There's also a dwarf Mondo grass that grows only about two inches tall and it's great to use between like flagstone stepping stones. Um, but um, it grows very, very slowly. So you want to use the larger Mondo grass for a ground cover type. Okay, Ajuga is a spring flowering ground cover. There's lots of different varieties, chocolate chip, bronze beauty, Caitlin's giant. So make sure you get the variety that you want. And, and then when it's done blooming, you can cut the blooms off or just let them fade. This one here needs really, really good drainage though. So don't put it in an area that's soggy or it will die from crown rot. This is horse herb. It's a native in our area. It's deciduous, so it dies down to the ground in the winter time, winter time. Um, but it's got these kind of nice appley green leaves and it gets teeny tiny little yellow blooms on it. Very drought tolerant. So if you've got a dry shade area, this is a great plant for that environment. Comes back faithfully every year. Um, it'll grow about a foot tall though, and then just form a mat as it spreads and it will spread. So put it where you want it. Frog fruit, very, very low growing. Um, it can handle sun or shade, uh, teeny tiny little leaves and teeny tiny little blooms on it. But this is a tough ground cover for our area. Uh, I took this picture at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden. So they've got lots of it over there in a native area that where they're growing lots of native plants. So check that one out over there. And this one is false lamium or lamiastrum. Um, this one's got a very wide growing range because uh, my mom grows it in Wisconsin and we can grow it down here, but it's got, um, I haven't had success with lanium, but false lanium has done well for me. Um, and it gets a yellow bloom on it in the springtime and it has this silvery uh, foliage with, you know, the green uh, edge and th through the veining through the middle. It's just a cool, bright shade tolerant ground cover. And then this one here, wild Chinese ginger, if you want to, this was taken at the Fort Worth, I mean, the Dallas Arboretum. So if you want to see a great display of this, that's the place to see it. This one though, put it where you want it because you will dig back to China to try to get the roots of it and you'll never get it. I have tried that, trust me. I wanted it in a certain spot and then I decided I didn't want a ground cover in that spot and I've been trying to dig it up for 10 years. Um, so just put it where you want it. Um, but it does spread very well, and it's evergreen, and it's got very, very interesting foliage. 
Um, it's hardy in the ground. I have not found it. I tried putting it in a pot and it died in the winter, this freeze in the in the pot, but it does very well in the ground. Strawberry begonia, a strawberry geranium. It has a geranium looking leaf, but it grows like strawberries where it sends out the little runners. Um, and then it gets a really pretty dainty white bloom on it in the uh, springtime. But this is a great shade loving um, ground cover. It's barely rooted in the ground though. So you don't have to worry about this being invasive in the least. It takes a couple years for it to form a nice thick ground cover growing. And um, this is just showing um, Creeping Jenny on the left-hand side, uh, another kind of ground cover uh, that loves water. So if you've got an area that doesn't drain very well, uh, that you, and it, you, it's either sun or shade, the ground, Creeping Jenny will do really well in that environment. And then here's just a picture of how I've used it under J Japanese maples because it's both of those plants stay very low growing and then the, the weeping maples, I just love the color just from foliage out of that. All right, that is it. I just want to again mention these references that have been very helpful to me. All of these plants and more are mentioned in all of these books. So especially Easy Gardens for North Central Texas, Steve Huddleston, of course, Neil Sperry's book, um, and then the native plant, um, if you want to look up different trees and shrubs and perennials and the native plant selection. So Anyway, again, all these same references from websites. Uh, I want to just remind you, any sh tree, shrub, vine, ground cover, whatever, if you want to Google it and put tamu.edu with your search, you will get Texas A&M research information about that particular plant and how it does in the state of Texas. So, and then also the other uh, sites right there. Again, I think that this video is recorded and will be on the saveterrantwater.com website. So you can check that out later. And then again, just mentioning my, uh, my references, my blog site or Instagram and Facebook um, for just information on those sites.